folks, now here's a story about Minnie the Moocher. She was a red hot hoochie coocher. She was the roughest, toughest rail. But Minnie had a heart as big as a hay whale. Holy, 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 hol
fill the space and make use of it. So Schreckengoss thought about New York and his memories. He had been there and what it suggested to him. And he said, well, New York, for me, 25-year-old guy, what do you expect? It's all about the nightlife. And of course, this is a punch bowl, so it's something that's going to be used for a party, a festive atmosphere. And so what kinds of designs has he used on the bowl? Well, first off, skyscrapers. Um, here on this side, you have kind of a, a bouquet of skyscrapers that are springing up and out as if you're down below and you see these rising up above. And then he has, of course, the scenes from the actual party that would have been happening. We have a trio of glasses here, a champagne flute, martini glasses with little olives in them. And then in the front, you have the word jazz. So it's this combination of party, of drinking, of celebration, of music all together, exactly what someone might have experienced if they had gone to a party in New York or gone out to a nightclub during this era. Now, of course, we're talking about the 1920s, early 1930s, so this is during the age of prohibition. And some of what Schreckengast has portrayed on the bowl would have been things that were illegal at the time period, but not at all uncommon. So the fact that we have alcohol bottles on the back of it, that is completely to be expected because everybody who was gonna have a good time in New York was gonna find a speakeasy, someplace where uh, behind closed doors they could celebrate. Uh, and that was completely understood, something that he wasn't in any way going to get in trouble for. Uh, he's just showing people the reality of what they were looking for and what made New York special. And so of course, nightlife, you also have stars here in the sky and the bowl is blue because Schreckengast was um, thinking about the colors of New York at night and how New York, probably one of the most, if not the most electrified city in America in this time period was filled with street lights so that when you were out and about in the streets of New York in this time period, you would have had uh, quite a bit of light surrounding you, but it wouldn't have been daylight. And for Schreckengast, his memories of the quality of the light in New York in this time period were that it did have this beautiful blue cast to it that kind of cast all over the scene. So he's used that as the dominant color within this bowl in order to inflect and uh, convey even more closely what his impressions are of the scene. Now, in order to do that, he's got two colors here that he's working with, a sort of black or dark color and then the blue. He used a special technique in order to create this. He makes the shape of the bowl and then coats it in a black slip all the way around and then scratches away the lighter areas that you see. So everything that you see here that is the bright blue color, that was originally covered with black and has been removed. So it works very much like a woodblock print, a relief print, lino cuts were also popular in this time period. Uh, so it's sort of drawing in reverse. You start with the dark and then everywhere that he scratches with his tool and reveals the white underlayer, that is the lighter areas that you see here. So if you look closely at the surface of the bowl, you can actually see evidence of the hand creation of the design on this piece. The dark areas are solid and flat, and then the areas that are lighter have a visible texture of each one of the individual scratches that is used. And that technique is actually called from the scratching scrafito, which is an Italian word, scrafito, the way this was made. So once he's scratched away the designs, then the bowl is glazed in this beautiful Egyptian blue color, and that's where we have the final design coming from. So Schreckengast makes the bowl. Um, it is presented to the client, and she loves it. She likes it so much that she orders two more of them. It is a complete hit. He is their little wunderkind now who has made such a success. And even more remarkable because the client who had commissioned this, unbeknownst to the designer, was someone quite important. It was Eleanor Roosevelt. And she was at that time first lady of the state of New York. And she wanted to present this bowl to her husband, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, as part of a celebration of his reelection as governor of New York and an anticipation of his 
hopefully ultimate uh, election to the White House, wanted more examples of these uh, in order to share for all of the entertaining that they no doubt would be doing as political figures and of course in celebration of their native state of New York. So the fame of the commission, uh, the success of the design, its popularity with these very sophisticated clients, Cowan Pottery, Shrek and Goss's employers, said we've got a winner and we need to put this into wider production. So they're going to put this bowl uh, ultimately into the catalog of things that they can make available. They've got the design, they've got the pattern that Shrek and Goss has drawn so that they can do more than one of these. And this bowl then becomes available for any of Cowan's clients to order. They ultimately produce it in three different sizes that would have been at slightly different price points, but in every case the designs would have had to have been hand done. So the bowl that you're seeing here is not the original bowl that was made for Eleanor Roosevelt. This was something that was made slightly later uh, and would have been purchased by another client of Cowan's once the bowl had gone into mass production. Now I say mass production, but in fact that might be a little bit misleading in this case because each one of the bowls was made individually. Um, they were rather labor intensive and somewhat expensive both to make and to sell. So they weren't getting a lot of orders for the bowl. That's not to say the design wasn't a success. It's just a matter of the price point, the number of clients who were going to want a piece of pottery this big, this grand, this high end. This was probably one of the more expensive and luxury items that Cowan was making at the time period. And you've also got to think about the year in which this was happening. So this is 1931. We're in the middle of the Great Depression. Folks don't have a lot of money in this time period to be spending on anything, much less a beautiful centerpiece for their dining room table or their party. So ultimately, we've estimated that Cowan Pottery's probably only produced somewhere in the neighborhood of 75, maybe as many 100 of these designs before in 1931, they went out of business. Not because of this bowl, um, just a factor of the Great Depression and that many companies in this time period were struggling. So this is a wonderful piece that we're excited to share and to present in, their in our galleries here at the Chrysler, um, not just because of its importance in the history of its connection to the Roosevelts, um, the beauty and power of the design, uh, but also because it's very rare and we're very lucky to have one of these available to show and to make part of this story. Now, one of the other things I like so much about this bowl is the way in which it fits into the history of modern art in the ways that Schreckengast, even though he was a young art student at the time, is channeling the latest art movements and incorporating them, involving them in his design for this particular bowl. So as you go around and look at all of the different elements that he's used here, the words, the lights, the symbols, um, the kind of uh, streams, beams of the street lights that are cutting across the city, the bottles, the glasses, Everything is collaged on top of each other and next to each other with no regard whatsoever for the scale. You've got a martini glass that's almost the same size as a skyscraper. This is very modern. He's not giving you a realistic scene. He's giving you this kind of collection of impressions that are sort of floating by you in his mind here. And to me, this layering, um, this complete disregard for scale, the freedom that he's given to the imagery here, uh, and also the, the sort of simplification of the designs in order to make a pattern for the bowl that can be mass produced. All of those are elements that he's learning from European modernism, from the works of Picasso and the other Cubist artists, and thinking about their ways of looking at the world that are not necessarily connected to a direct view of something, but a collection of impressions that are being brought together, they're being synthesized, and then reproduced uh, with, a, with a level of freedom and music and energy that I think are very specific, very original, and very fresh to the 1920s and 30s. So just purely from a stylistic sense, all of that history that I told you a moment ago, put all that aside, you look at this bowl and you say, absolutely, this is coming straight out of the 1920s, out of the jazz age, out of the art movement, art deco. So the idea in this time period that um, the simplification of these designs was something that was 
both modern, machine age in a way, but also sophisticated and beautiful, uh, an art style that was symbolic of progress and prosperity and optimism, even though we're in the middle of the Great Depression. All of these things were important for folks to celebrate in this time period and would have been desirable things for them to present at their home, especially in a party atmosphere. Thank you.